Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AISC live webinar, Trust Design and Construction, presented by Thomas Meyer. Today is August 9, 2018. My name is Nate Goner with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Thomas Meyer. Thomas Meyer is a principal at Magnuson Clemenchik Associates in Seattle. He received a BS in Civil Engineering from Northwestern University. He is a senior leader in Magnuson Clemenchik's Convention Center Group, managing large and complex convention center projects around the world. Tom, I want to thank you for being here, and I will now turn the floor over to you. Nate, thanks very much for that introduction, and thanks to everyone who chose to join us on today's discussion. I've had the fortunate experience to be involved in a large number of complex, long-span structures uh, throughout the world, and I'm honored to be able to bring that experience to today's discussion. Today we're going to focus on what I will call a straight-over tackle steel truss system, which is commonly used to support floors and roofs. So the scope of today's discussion will consist of a truss system that's generally two-dimensional with a decking at the top cord level, and that decking would support either a roof without concrete topping or a floor with a concrete topping. It would have a free and open bottom cord plane and would have a truss stability system. Today's discussion topics will flow in the order in which we would go through and work through the design of a long span truss. So first we're going to establish design criteria that affect the design of long span structures. We're going to talk about the geometry of trusses We'll move on to member shape selection, discuss analysis of trusses, discuss member design, discuss truss connections, and finally talk a little bit about stability, and afterward I'll provide a design example. So let's start right in with the design criteria and what is unique to long span structures that might be uh, different from a more conventional beam and girder floor system. So we can start with what we typically refer to as the strength design considerations, and these are our design loads. And of course, on the dead load side, you would have your structural weight and also the superimposed dead loads in the facility, ceilings, lights, mechanical equipment, floor finishes, partitions, etc. What's unique about long span structures is that the self weight of the structure is often significant in the design. And in addition to the weight of the members, the connection material weight often becomes important. After we determine our dead loads, we move on to our code prescribed uniform live loads. But often long span structures have unique facility specific uniform live loads. In the world I I design in convention centers, it's common that an exhibit hall floor has a uniform live load of 350 pound per square foot. This is typically not prescribed by the building code, but it is facility specific. Therefore, it's very important that you talk to the operators and the owners of the facilities when you design your long span structures so that you know how they intend to use the facility and understand what live load might be appropriate for that facility. In addition, Long span structures often support operational equipment. These might be JLG type lifts to fix lights or to hang rib rigging. There's often items suspended from the bottom cord, such as operable partitions in a convention center or in an arena, and rigging loads, as I previously mentioned. And often in an arena, you might have large scoreboards and lights and other things like that that are significant in the design of the long span structure. So again, it's very important to have conversations with the users and operators and owners of the facility to understand what you will be supporting and from what level of the trust. 
So after you work through your design loads, we now have to talk about the serviceability design. And what's unique about long span structures is the standard rules of design for beam and girder systems, L over 240 for total loads, L over 360 for live loads, is often not relevant. In a simple example, a 120 foot span with an L over 240 deflection is six inches. And similarly with L over 360 for live load is four inches. And quite often that's going to be too much deflection. So how do you know what is an appropriate amount of deflection? Well, there are lots of considerations to think about. Most importantly, it is what is the space supporting? What are the uses of the space? And what will be tolerable to the clients? For example, there may be cladding systems if this is a truss located along the perimeter or there might be architectural partitions and other systems underneath the floor trusses. And you need to understand what sort of deflections those systems can accommodate. Conversely, if you, those allowable deflections are unknown, it's very important that you communicate on your drawings what deflections these, those follow-on systems need to accommodate in your design. So for example, if you've designed a perimeter truss for a three inch deflection, you will need to communicate that to the cladding designer and the cladding manufacturer such that they can design their joints and things accordingly. Similarly with operable partitions, which often have a deflection track at the base, which absorbs the differential deflection between the floor above and the floor below and you need to communicate very carefully with the manufacturers of those partitions as to what deflections they need to be able to accommodate. For roofs, you need to very carefully consider roof drainage and ponding. It's very easy for a roof truss to, to deflect in a way that would result in negative drainage. And if this is the case, then you need to consider how to accommodate that either through limiting the deflections or through cambering of the truss. A note about camber with respect to trusses. The standard tolerance, according to the code of standard practice for a truss, is L over 800, where L is measured from the distance to the closest support to the point where the camber is specified. So for that 120 foot truss example that we talked about earlier, the tolerance on the camber is nearly plus or minus one inch. So that's very important when designing your long span structure and specifying your camber to under, understand that something may come out cambered one inch more or less than what you've assumed in your design and need to understand what that might mean in the in the end result for your structure. So there are the deflection side of things. What often governs the design of long span floors are floor vibrations. And what we use for the acceptance criteria in evaluating floor vibrations is Design Guide 11. I have a picture of the first edition on the slide, however, there is a second edition that has been issued. So you always want to consult this when you are beginning a long span floor design. From that, the acceptance criteria would depend upon the space that you are supporting. Airports and shopping malls, for example, have a, an acceptance criteria of 1.5% G, and those are the accelerations that occur when a person or people are walking on the floor. Similarly, pedestrian bridges have acceptance criteria. If it's an indoor pedestrian bridge, it's typically 1.5% G, and an outdoor pedestrian bridge would be 5% G. Often long span structures need to accommodate ballroom type functions, and in those ballrooms you will often have a dining and dancing event set up. In this case, you'll have a dance floor, and surrounding that dance floor or adjacent to that dance floor, you'll have a series of dining tables. 
and it's important that the folks sitting down enjoying their wine or their dinner or their dessert aren't uncomfortable due to the rhythmic activity that occurs in the dance floor. And AISC's design guide recommends a an acceleration limit of 2% G for the folks sitting at the dining tables. And we'll talk more about this uh, later in the presentation. So after you've established your strength and serviceability criteria, you move into determining the geometry of your truss. So first, we want to talk about depth. And what is an appropriate depth for a long span structure? When we think to floor beams and girders, we typically have a rule of thumb, and that's the span in feet divided by two. That would then determine what your structural depth would be. So for a 60-foot span, you're typically going to result in a three-foot structural depth, and that would typically result in an economical and serviceable design. For trusses, it's a little bit different. The truss, for, for optimizing a truss, we typically will plot an optimization curve where on the bottom we'll plot the depth and on the vertical axis we'll plot the weight. What you'll find is that as you increase the depth, the truss weight reduces, so it becomes more and more efficient. And simply what happens is the cord forces are reduced. If you think about the old uh, simple span mechanics, statics, WL squared over 8, and you take that moment and divide it by the effective depth of your truss, that becomes your cord force. As your cord force decreases, then your cord sizes subsequently decrease. But what happens is eventually you get to a point where the web members become long. And when that happens, the weight of the web members increase, and they increase at a rate that becomes faster than the cords are decreasing. And so effectively, you'll bottom out. And even if you go deeper than that, you might actually get more weight in the truss, and that's due to the fact that the web members are getting extremely long, and they're, they're overcoming any savings you're realizing in the uh, reduction in the cord sizes. So what we want to be, if we, if we rule the world, is where the red circle is at the bottom of that curve. There are typical, typically, though, there are offsetting costs in the building. So the deeper you make the truss, the more cladding you have to add to the building. If it's a floor truss, that means your floor heights are probably increasing, and so you're adding lengths to vertical transportation systems, uh, ducts, and things like that as well. So there becomes a total building cost. So the actual optimum depth for a truss is really going to depend on the entire building system. And so these conversations need to occur with the contractors, with the other uh, consultants on the project with the architect to arrive at what the most optimum depth is for this truss system. But typically you're going to want to be in the portion of the curve where it's flattening out and not in the portion where it's steep. And so from that, over time we've developed some general rules to think about in terms of span to depth ratio for our trusses. And for a roof truss, that relatively flat portion of the curve occurs at a span to depth ratio between 12 and 15. So if you're in a preliminary design meeting with your architect and you're talking about a roof truss and they ask you the inevitable question, how deep will that truss be, you can get yourself pretty close to the ballpark by uh, thinking about L over 12 or L over 15. Similarly, for a floor truss that's strength controlled or not sensitive to floor vibrations, that relative flat portion of the curve occurs at a span to depth ratio between 8 and 10. And for a floor truss that's vibration controlled, that span to depth ratio is 6 to 8. So vibration controlled trusses are often very deep in order to keep them reasonably economical. 
again, you want to avoid those cases where you see significant increases by decreasing the depth. So where you're above 15 for a roof, above 10 for a strength control floor truss, and above 8 for a vibration control floor truss. So after you determine the depth, you want to think about the layout of the panel points. And there are a number of things that you might consider. Architecturally, is there, if the truss is going to be expressed or exposed, is there an architectural consideration and a, and a uh, proportion that the architect might find appealing? There will also be considerations with tension and compression member efficiency. So this would result in how you orient the diagonal members and the vertical members. Likewise, load flow, those two flow hand in hand. And MEP routing can be a big one as well. There are oftentimes large spaces underneath the long span trusses, which require lots of large ducts and significant mechanical routing. And you need to coordinate the routing of those ducts with your trusses. And often that might require special panel point layouts in order to accommodate the mechanical routing. So we can talk about the most commonly used layouts for the webs. We have the Pratt truss. And the Pratt truss takes advantage of putting the longest diagonal members in tension. And the shortest vertical web members are in compression. This is true of a uniformly loaded simple span truss, such as the one shown here. And in this case, the load flow is through both the verticals and the diagonals of the truss. The how truss takes that idea and flips it on its head and puts the longer members in compression and the shorter members in tension. And this can get the load to the supports a little bit quicker than the other layout and can often be an economical truss as well. Finally, we have the Warren truss. And in the Warren truss, the diagonals resist both tension and compression. And in this type of a truss, the load flow stays in the diagonals, and the verticals are there to, to either reduce the unbraced lengths of the cords or to, to resist a point load or something that might be coming in. Which brings up the topic of whether or not you want to align the panel points with the incoming framing. In the top picture, you can see that the incoming framing do, do, does align with the panel points. And this is often a good arrangement. But it's not always efficient for the truss to try to make everything time out perfectly. And so sometimes you end up with the situation in which the floor framing is not perfectly aligned with the panel points of the truss. And so what does that mean? Well, we did a couple of examples. And in the one shown here, we have the same truss, the same loading, except that in the top picture, the point loads of the incoming framing is aligned with the panel points. And in the bottom picture, the incoming framing doesn't align. And there is only a small difference in the truss weight, about 0.1 ton. And what that suggests is for a uniformly loaded truss, you're going to see similar results either way. And so the suggestion I would have is if you can align and still result in roughly 45 degree web members, then I would say go for it. If you can't make that work and you have to have to shift the beams off the panel points, I would say don't lose too much sleep over it unless you have a large incoming point load and then you're going to want to align the panel point. Another consideration is shipping. So in the pictures you see here, we have a truss that's arriving to the site completely 
prefabricated in the dead of night. The roads closed in the middle of the day, and the truss is picked and erected in one piece. This is not often feasible. And often the trusses are shipped to the site in pieces. And so the slide you see here is not a hard and fast rule. Every state has different requirements. Every site and every project will have different requirements. So it's very important to have conversations with your contractors and to understand what the shipping limitations are in your particular instance. If you don't have any access to to the contractor and you need to make some assumptions along the way, these are some rough dimensions of what can fit on a truck uh, in one piece. Again, not hard and fast rules, but it provides you a good starting point if you have no other information to go on. And the picture on the bottom is not very common, but I suppose it can be done. As in the case here, where the fab shop was down the road from the project site. And so in this case, we had our 90-foot floor trusses shipped to the site in one piece and erected. So there are always exceptions to the rules, and that's why it's very important that you're talking to your contractors about where your material will be sourced and what the shipping requirements might be so that you can know where to locate your splices. So now let's talk a little bit about member shapes and what considerations do we go through when we choose the shapes of the members that we're using for our truss. So when we break a truss down, we have web members. In this case, we have the tension web members on the diagonal, and the compression web members are vertical. And so let's talk about what shapes are often used for web members. The most commonly used shapes are double angles. You also use hollow structural sections and wide flanges. And what might drive the, the selection of a shape? Quite often, architects may want to weigh in on this. If it's, again, if it's an expressed or exposed truss, they might have an opinion. And often you'll see HSS sections as the web members for architecturally exposed trusses. The truss connections often can govern what shapes you use. Certain members are easier to connect than others. And then of course there's always compression and tension efficiency considerations and shape costs. Do you have premiums between shapes? So good truss member selection often requires dialogue again with the architect with the contractors, with other disciplines, to see if there's anything that one shape might, might provide as a benefit over another. And when we talk about cord members, we have the tension cord and the compression cord, of course. And again, we have some considerations with respect to how we choose the cords. Commonly used sections are wide flanges, HSS, and WTs. Again, we have architectural considerations, truss connection considerations, shape costs, incoming member connection considerations, and alignment considerations. And we're going to illustrate the bottom two for you. When we think about incoming members, we have to think about compatibility of the beams that are being supported by the truss. In this example, we have trusses that are spaced widely apart. And it's very common to use a W14 cord as your compression cord because it's an excellent, efficient member to use for compression. That's why we use them as columns. But if the trusses are far apart and the beams need to be deep relative to that W14 cord, you can have some interesting looking end connections if you haven't thought about it in advance. And so, there are ways to mitigate this. One is to deepen the cord. Perhaps think about heavy W36s or heavy W24s. Another might be to offset the 
the cord and place the beams on top of the cord. Just things you need to think about as you're selecting the member shapes and the profiles. We also have alignment considerations. Are you aligning top of steel as you would be in a top cord that's supporting decking? In that case, you're going to have eccentricity at the bottom only where you have an offset between the flanges. And this happens when you change cord sizes at a splice. The bottom cord might often be center line aligned, which you see on the right-hand side. And in that case, you don't have an eccentricity, but now you have a potential misalignment of both the top and bottom flange. Well, these are easy to deal with. And what it means is that you typically will have filler plates. And in the case on the left, you would have a relatively thick filler plate here on the bottom. And on the right, you might have relatively thin filler plates, but you have them both on the top and the bottom. And you need to consider that in the design of your truss and in your truss connections. So after we've figured out what member shapes we want to consider, we go through and talk about how to analyze the truss. And probably the biggest debate or question we want to ask ourselves is, do we consider fixity at the member ends? If we think about the cords and we look at a typical cord splice, like the picture on the left, we can very easily see that that, that, that particular truss or that particular connection has a good deal of fixity to it. And so when we model cord splices, we would typically model the fixity at that connection. When we look at the web member, in the case of the double angles, well, there is some fixity there. However, we would often consider that as a pinned connection, especially when considering the strength design. For serviceability, we might think about whether or not we can consider that connection fixed as we're thinking about the relative magnitude of the applied load that we're considering in the serviceability case, as we might in a vibration analysis. Another question that comes up is, do you consider composite action between the slab and the top cord in compression? You certainly can. Uh, we don't always do this. Sometimes we rely only on the bare steel. And sometimes we, can, we try to take advantage of the composite action depending on the case. What's really important, though, is if you are taking advantage of the composite action, that that's clearly communicated in the drawings because an uh, opening cut near that truss in the future would compromise the load carrying capacity of the truss, as it would in a floor system that uses composite, system, composite design. You just need to make sure that it's clear on the documents that this truss design did consider that composite action so that someone in the future can understand that when they're analyzing a modification to the structure. Another important consideration with the applied loads is making sure that the analysis considers the application of the loading with respect to where it will be applied in life. So you have the top cord loads, which would be where your floor beams or your roof beams come in. And then you often have bottom cord loads from things that are hanging from the bottom of the truss, rigging, partitions, lights, et cetera. And so it's very important to provide the loading in the analysis where it occurs in the truss to make sure that you capture the minor bending moments in the cords that will occur as a result, because the cords have to span between the panel points. So now we can talk a little bit more about floor vibrations. And one thing that's different about floor vibrations is that, for long span structures, is that in a, in a beam and girder system, it's often governed by a single person walking. But in a long span structure, that's not the case. A single person simply doesn't have the input energy to get a long span system moving unless it's really, really flexible. And so what's often con going to control that are groups of people walking. And for some guidance on how to address that, we can turn to ISO 10137. 
And this criteria is for uncoordinated group walking or not in unison, so the opposite of a marching band. So the point here is that it's not a um, everybody walking at the same frequency and not a rhythmic type input. But what you'll find is that as the larger the area that you consider being loaded by the walking, the less the uniform load is for that particular event. So you may need to consider multiple conditions. For example, you might consider the whole truss being loaded by a group of walkers. You might also consider a smaller subsection of people loaded uh, only at the mid-span because you're going to get a larger uniform load over the center portion of the span because the size of the group is smaller. And one might govern over the other. So it's important to look at a number of different conditions depending on your case to determine what's going to govern the design. Then we have, as I mentioned before, floor, span, floor structures and long span structures that are subject to rhythmic excitation, such as a dining and dancing event. There are three types of analysis we can do. We can do a basic hand calculation, and that is outlined in Design Guide 11. Again, this is a picture of the first edition, and now a second edition has been published, so you want to consult the latest edition of that. And this is a generally simplified method, very easy to calculate. You can do it by hand. You can do it rather quickly. And the downside to it is it's relatively conservative compared to other methods. It's effectively based on loading the entire span at once. You can make some provisions to reduce the loading for a partial span condition. However, it's a very simplified approach. There's another approach which provides modified hand calculations, and that is a little bit more refined, and it also considers partial span loading. And then finally, you can do three-dimensional finite element modeling. In this case, you can apply, build a, a finite element model uh, and consider the three-dimensional stiffness of the structure. You can consider composite action with the slab. And you can put the input in the location that you deem as worst case, or perhaps you've discussed with the facility owners where the input exactly will occur, and you can analyze it in a specific location. And from that, you do a steady state analysis, and you can predict the accelerations due to the input. And so all three analyses are valid. You can implement e any of them. However, you will get different results when you do. So with the basic hand calculation for a given case, the predicted floor acceleration was 10.6% g. We did the modified hand calculation, and we predicted a floor acceleration of 4% g. And when we did the dynamic analysis model for the same activity and the same input, it predicted a floor acceleration of 2% g. So like anything, the more detailed the analysis, the more refined the results. And perhaps you want to consider that in some cases, or sometimes the basic hand calculation or the modified hand calculation gives you a satisfactory result. It's really up to the judgment of the engineer. So now let's talk about member design. So we have very basically, compression members to design and tension members. And as I mentioned before, you will get bending moments in the cord members. And so you need to consider the combined effects of the axial and bending forces. And you simply determine those forces and design per AASC 360 criteria. The design of the members is probably the easiest part of the truss design. One of the things that you have to talk, ask yourself is what are the 
what are you considering to brace the top cord? This is really important as it can obviously affect the size of the top cord. So in this example, each of the beams is assumed, each of the floor beams is assumed to brace the top cord. So therefore you're going to have a weak axis flexural buckling length of that cord of 10 feet or whatever the beam spacing is in this case. But what that means though is that every one of those floor beams then has to be designed for the axial loads associated with bracing that top cord. So maybe there's a trade-off in accepting a larger spacing of the bracing points and then maybe you're only considering the axial force in a certain number of those members. It's up to your engineering judgment, either are valid but you need to make sure that you follow your assumption all the way through to conclusion. So now we're going to move into what's more of an art and less of a science, although of course the science still exists, but truss connections. So we'll talk a lot about truss connections and we'll talk about both bolted and welded options. So for bolted truss connections, the things we want to ask ourselves are what are we going to use, standard holes or slotted or oversized holes for fit up? What grade of bolt are we going to use? What bolt diameter? Are we going to use a consistent bolt diameter or vary, vary the bolt sizes? Are we going to use slip critical or bearing bolts? Are we going to use N or X bolts? All the same types of connection, uh, questions you'd ask yourself for any connection design, but it's really important in trusses that you consider this carefully. My recommendation would be to have conversations with fabricators and erectors and contractors if, if they're available to you on the project because they'll all have their preferences. Uh, I can give you an example of one project I'm working on right now where we are using all one and a quarter inch A490 X bolts and another project in another part of the country, we were using all one inch A490 slip critical in oversized holes. So every contractor has their preference, and so it's important to have that discussion with the contractor. It's also very important that you choose an approach and try to be as consistent as possible in, the, in the, all of your connection designs. Choose one bolt diameter, choose N or X, choose slip critical or bearing bolts, and just be consistent. One thing about bolted connections is you have net section and block shear considerations that become significant. When you have large demands in your in your axial members and you're going to splice those and you need a lot of bolts to put in to put in to resist the forces, then you end up taking a lot of the net section away and you might end up having to either limit the demand capacity ratio during your design of the member, you might end up looking at staggering the bolts, or you might up end up with double, doubler plates being required, which I wouldn't recommend. I would upsize the member and try to avoid doubler plates wherever possible. Another thing to consider is weld access if the bolts don't fit. And what you see in this picture, which is hard to, hard to see, is that the iron workers are pounding with large sledgehammers the bolts into the bolt holes as they're fitting this truss up. It just simply didn't fit, doesn't always fit up the way you want it to. And so you need to have in your back pocket the ability to weld in the field in order to, um, we, in order to um, deal with fit up issues that inevitably occur in the field. So we want to talk about now the location of cord splices and what do we need to consider. First of all, we want to ask ourselves, are we bolting it or welding it? The welded splice is pretty straightforward, but the bolted splice has a lot more considerations. 
As we alluded to before, we have the alignment question. So are your center lines aligned? And if so, where are the filler plates existing? Or is the top of steel aligned and do you have a large filler plate at the bottom? And if it's larger than a quarter inch, obviously you have considerations that need to occur in terms of the design of that bolted connection. In this example, when you aggressively change the cord size like we see here, you have a very thick filler plate. And so in this case, we, we might have either used a reduced bolt value or we might have welded that shim or that filler to the, the um, member to develop the force or we might have provided extra bolts in accordance with the AISC requirements. So when you locate the cord splice, you need to consider a number of things. You need to consider that these splices become quite long. If you look again at that example, that splice is probably several feet long. And so it can very easily conflict with other things in the, either in the truss itself or with incoming members or with MEP systems. So you want to very carefully locate your cord splice with respect to all of the other things that are going on in your structure. So now we're going to talk about web to cord connections. And the philosophical question you ask yourself is, do we gusset or not gusset? So a quick word about connections without gussets. On the positive side, they're elegant. Architects often prefer them. The lack of a gusset reduces conflicts with mechanical or other things. The cons, they're typically very expensive. They require extensive TJP or PJP welding. If anything is going to be constructed on the site, this can be very slow and very expensive. And it's not appropriate for all shapes. Typically for wide flanges or HSS, you might see this. Um, for double angles and other shapes, you typically wouldn't see this. So the advantages of the gussets are you can do them bolted or feel, fillet welded. You can, uh, they often are faster on the site. Uh, the cons on the downside is that the large gussets can often conflict with MEP routing and make you think harder about cord, uh, splice locations and other things in incoming members, as we mentioned before. Another word about gusset plate connections. This is maybe a cautionary tale. If you look at this floor system, we have uh, everything identified in red as a truss, and it lends itself nicely to scheduling. So in this case, the way we did it was we elevated the truss on each web member, we indicated the number of bolts. And then in the table, you would find the number of bolts and then find the angle of the web member, and then you would get all of your connection, get all of your connection information from that. The downside of that is if you, this can be easy to produce in an engineering world, uh, can be quick, can be efficient, you can do this via spreadsheet, it's easy to document. However, if you aren't carefully checking your geometries, you can very easily end up with something that looks like this. While it works, technically, it's probably an example of what you wouldn't want to do. Uh, and so you want to make sure that if you are scheduling all of your gussets, you're actually taking a little bit of time to draw the gusset so you understand what that geometry really looks like. So with double angles, you can bolt or weld them to the gusset plate very easily. Some words about double angles. When the leg is less than six inches, you can only use one row of bolts. When it's six, you can use two rows, and you can, if, but the bolts need to be staggered. If it's eight, then you can use two rows, and they can be in line. If you have high demands in your double angles, the bolt groups can get quite long, so you need to check that. Uh, an advantage is, again, easy field bolt installation, or if the bolts don't 
don't fit up, you can easily fill it weld the angle to the gusset plate. There's often shear lag effects as the connection is not concentric with the centroid of the double angle. And of course, you don't want to forget your stitch plates that may be required for your compression members. So with HSS connections, you can again bolt them or weld them to the support. With the welded HSS, if you slot it and wrap it around the gusset plate, then you have a net section check that you need to do as you've lost some material, especially as the gusset plates become thick. So if you have a thin walled tension HSS and a rather thick gusset, then you might end up with some net section issues that you need to address, and so you might need a patch plate on the outside of that HSS. This is nice because you can weld it in the shop, but it also might mean that you're doing a lot of field welding if the members are brought out in pieces and it's, it's erected on site. Here's an example of bolting an HSS to the cords and to the support. In this case, all of the welding is done in the shop and all of the bolting is done in the field. This is a very nice connection. We use this one quite often in our truss designs. One thing about this connection, though, is that there's an eccentricity somewhere. And so you have to ask yourself, is the gusset plate centered on the beam and column, on the cord and the column, and the HSS and the knife plate are offset? Or do you center the HSS and its knife plate and offset the gusset? So it's a question you have to ask yourself and probably communicate on your drawings what your assumption is. Otherwise, you can be sure that that might be RFI number one. With wide flanges, again, you can bolt or weld them to the gusset plates. Wide flanges are often used when the web demands are high or if you have large unbraced lengths and the other shapes aren't efficient. Some pictures here. So things about wide flanges is you can get a large number of bolts per row if you have a st uh, stock EW14, for example. You can get quite compact connections. As we mentioned before, you do have the net section issues, and it may often result in a doubler plate. So the word of advice is to make sure you're doing those checks and upsizing members to avoid doublers wherever possible. You can also take wide flanges and orient the webs horizontal. And this works great if all the members are the same size, exactly the same size. If not, you have to ask yourself where are the filler plates and make sure that you've considered that in your connection details. Another thing, another way to connect that would be to weld the gusset directly to the flange. This works sometimes if the member geometries work out just right. However, if you're varying your webs and your cord is not varying, you can often run into a case where that gusset plate doesn't sit nicely on the flanges of the cord, and so you need to really think hard about those connection details. Another consideration with the web horizontal, if it is supporting decking, you often have a section of your deck that becomes unsupported uh, through the web of the W14, so you need to make sure that you're providing some shim or support for your deck in those conditions. One thing I would mention, when you do have a, a geometry uh, condition where your roof is sloping and you might have some complexities in that. This can be a nice detail because it allows you to divorce the top of steel of the incoming members from the top of steel of the uh, truss cord and it can allow for 
little bit more complicated geometries more easily than if the web is vertical. Truss end connections can be designed similar to vertical bracing connections, and there's very good guidance in Design Guide 29 about how to go about this connection design. And typically we're going to employ the KISS method in our practice, uh, but you can use any of the appropriate methods for the connection design. One thing about truss end connections is what are you doing at the free bottom cord? Do you slot that connection or do you lock it? There's implications on all sides. So typically the truss end rotation is taken up by elongation of the cord members and the rotation then occurs by allowing the free bottom cord to move relative to the support. And so it might be common to provide permanently slotted connections where the bolts take only the vertical shear associated with that member, which might only be the member self-weight, but it might also be the member self-weight plus whatever um, elements might be hanging off the bottom cord in that last panel. And so you get a very compact connection and you're not delivering any load and the truss is able to rotate freely throughout its life. In that case, though, that is not a brace point for that column, and so you need to make sure that you're considering that in the design of the column. Alternatively, if you lock that bottom cord in and don't provide a slotted connection, then you are going to be developing forces into that support, and they will de be developed in with respect to the relative stiffness of that support, and so you will be inducing a force through that connection, an axial force through the connection that you'll need to design for, and in this case where you see a column, you'll be putting a bending moment in that column which you would need to consider in that column's design. Another way to approach this, uh, what we often do is allow it to slip during placement of all the dead loads. Once all the dead loads are in place, we will lock it in and then have it locked for the transient loading or the live loads. So one thing about truss connections is that the material weight can become significant. If you look at the picture on the left, that's what's often bid is members with no connection information. For example, if this is a delegated connection design project, the, there is no connection information. There may be an indicative detail or two, um, but there are no bolt counts, there are no plates, so there's n not a good way to... Or, or you need to consider what the connection material means in terms of the weight of the truss, because the final design looks something like the picture on the, light, on the right with all of the flange plates and the bolts and the gussets and, and what have you. And so a well-proportioned truss, the connection material is often about 15% of the self-weight of the member. And when I say the self-weight of the member, what I'm talking about there is the centerline lengths of the members from work point to work point. If you add all of that up and you come up with a weight for the truss and then you add 15%, then that would give you the total weight of the truss. Those connection factors can increase quite rapidly if the truss resists really high loads or is poorly proportioned and you have really large gusset plates and lots of bolts and lots of uh, stiffeners and things like that. So again, you want to make sure that you're considering that and communicating that if it's a bid environment or thinking about that in the design of the truss itself and adding that extra self-weight. So we can move on and talk a little bit about stability considerations for our trusses. So in this picture, we're looking at the top cord plan, and I realize it's a little bit difficult to see, but we have our trusses and our beam framing, and then we have our horizontal diaphragm truss in here. and. So we, we want to think about what that means for stability of the truss. 
the bottom cord plane would have beams tying the trusses together on some spacing. And in elevation, what that looks like is the, the beam framing here and the bottom cord framing here and some sort of diagonals that bring the loads in, that accumulate in the bottom cord and bring them up to your diaphragm where they can then get taken to the lateral force resisting system. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to limit the twist of the truss. It also provides lateral bracing at the compression cord and provides torsional bracing to connect the tension and compression members and stability to brace the compression web members. What are the considerations? You'll have to ask yourself and use your judgment, do you consider all trusses buckling in the same mode? I would contend that this is good practice, and not only that, it often doesn't penalize the structural design too much. What really ends up governing the stability bracing more than the, demand, the total demand is the stiffness of that system. So we want to very carefully consider both the strength and the stiffness of that stability load path, because if it's not stiff enough, it won't do its job. Be very diligent about bracing the tips of cantilevers. Watch very carefully for cord axial load reversals and make sure your bracing system considers that. Make sure you're adding bracing forces to all of your load cases accordingly. And consider whether the bracing is panel bracing or point bracing. Okay, so now that we've talked about the considerations, let's look at an example. So this example is something, it's not a, an exact example, but it's pretty close to something that I've seen see on a regular basis. So we have a 90 foot by 90 foot bay, and we have trusses in the north-south direction at 30 feet on center, and those are going to be supported by girder trusses running east-west between the columns. We'll assume for this example that we have four and a half inch slab on three inch steel deck, so seven and a half inch total thickness. And when we run our numbers, we calculated that the typical floor beam is a W1830 by 35, and those are spaced at 10 feet on center. In this example, we're going to locate our stability bracing at 30 feet, as shown here. And so when we look at the bottom cord, this is what it looks like. In addition to the loads we mentioned above, we're going to have a rigging program. We talked to our owner and they said we want 2,500 pound rigging points at 15 feet on center. And so we did a number on those and we calculated a W18 by 50. And again, the bottom cord bracing is 30 feet on center. We did our jobs with our architects and other disciplines and we talked about appropriate depths. So for this example, we have 10 feet of overall structural depth, so our span to depth ratio is 9, and that's right within the uh, wheelhouse that we talked about earlier. One thing that is important is when you are talking about truss depth and structure depth with your clients, um, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the overall depth, or are you talking about the effective depth? And make sure that that's communicated very clearly to the client when you're having the conversation. If you say 10 feet, do you mean the overall depth or do you mean the center to center of your cords? Uh, because that can be a point of miscommunication very easily. And so in this case, I'm assuming it's the overall depth. And what does that mean? It means our effective depth, I'm going to estimate in this case, is about 7 feet, 10 and a half inches. And how I got there was I took the 10 feet overall, I subtracted out the 7.5 inch slab depth, and then I assumed that these would be relatively heavy W14, so I offset another 9 inches to the centroid, and that assumption can be verified and refined later in the analysis. But for the, for the purposes of this conversation, we'll assume that it's correct, and we'll assume that 7 feet 10.5 is our effective depth. 
when we look at the elevation of the truss, we, we know that it's 90 feet long, and we assume that we're going to have to ship this to the site in two pieces, and so we've located a splice midway between the fourth panel point from the left, and we're looking at a view of where the applied loads are. We have the rigging loads on the bottom cord, and we have the floor loads on the top cord. We've gone through some considerations and we've decided to use W14 cords and HSS webs. And for the purposes of this conversation and this example, I've decided to limit the size of the HSS to uh, six by six by a quarter as my smallest member. That's arbitrary. Uh, you can choose your own limits or design to the most efficient shape at your discretion. So again, a summary of our loads. Slab on deck, 75 pounds per square foot. The steel framing self-weight. We have a ceiling MEP miscellaneous load allowance of 10 pounds per square foot. We have the truss self-weight. We have a uniform live load of 250 pounds per square foot. And we have the rigging per the previous diagram. Our serviceability criteria, we're going to, we talked to the operators and this is not sensitive to floor vi vibrations and we're going to limit the live load to two inches based on partitions that are underneath the floor trusses. Here's a picture of our dead loads. The, they are applied in the analysis model where they're going to occur. Again, we have the top cord loads and the bottom cord load. Again, with the live loads, we have the same picture. So we, we treat the rigging load as a live load in this case. First thing I always like to do is a quick hand calculation using simple statics. So we can treat this as a simple span beam, put our applied loading on it, develop our shear and moment diagrams, and use this to estimate our member sizes before we really do a refined analysis. So we, before we turn the computer on, we want to know where we're headed. So in this case, when you do that, the end shear is 667 kips, and you can use the geometry of your panel points to work that into a design load on the tension on the di on the end diagonal. And so that'll give you a rough sense of of your largest diagonal member, because the shear will be obviously the vertical component in that in that member. We calculate a mid-span moment of 16,750 kip feet. These are ultimate loads under a load case of 1.2 dead and 1.6 live. And so when we estimate the cord force, that works out to 2,130 kips. So it would be important that when we do our analysis that we get results that are similar to this and that we go back to this hand calculation. They won't be exactly the same, but we want to use this as a way to cross-check our computer analysis. For the analysis, we have our boundary conditions and end releases, member end releases. So like I mentioned before, we're treating the cords, both top and bottom, as continuous members. I've modeled the splice where it occurs in the structure here. I've added a node here simply to easily check mid-span deflections. And you can see that the web members are pinned at the ends. And then for the boundary conditions, we have out-of-plane restraints where we have, at the top cord, where we have our, our panel point bracing. And the end conditions, we have one pin here. So we're only restraining in the east-west direction or in the longitudinal direction in one point on the support, which will allow all of the axial members of the cord, all of the cords to develop axial members and the, cord, the forces won't go into the supports. So we have rollers for the other three supports. And you may have different restraints in your structure, but in this example, these are the restraints that we're using. So we've done the analysis and under that ultimate load case, 
We actually come up with a cord force of 2,109 kips, which is very close to our estimated value. And you can see that the end diagonal is 1,100 kips, which has a vertical component that's very close to, again, to our estimated value. If we look at the moments in the members, you can see that the, the cords do develop some moments, and they're relatively decent sized. And what I would say is that you're typically going to see in a case like this that the, the moment takes about 20% of the demand capacity ratio for that center span or that center portion of the top cord. So in our design, what I've assumed for unbraced lengths in the top cord for the strong axis, which would be in the plane of bending, I've assumed that the panel points brace that cord. In the out of plane, I've taken the spacing of the panel points at 30 feet. Again, as we talked before, you could use each and every incoming member to resist the flexural buckling of that section, and you just have to make sure that you're very consistent with that load path all the way through. I have elected to conservatively assume that the, the intermediate beams aren't bracing that top cord, except for lateral torsional buckling. And at the bottom cord, again, you have the unbraced length in the plane of bending of 10 feet and out of plane 30 feet because that is the spacing of our bracing system. And that's both flexural and lateral torsional buckling bracing. For the verticals, we're simply using the lengths of the center line lengths of those members, so 7 feet 10 and a half for the verticals, and same for the diagonals, which end up being about 12 feet 9 inches, plus or minus. And so we go through the design, and we use AISC 360, and we do our checks, and we determine that the member sizes are as shown. So we have a range of just a 6 by 6 by 4, as I I arbitrarily chose that as a minimum size, and then range all the way up to 10 by 10 by 3 quarters, which is getting pretty heavy for a member, but uh, not completely unreasonable. And the cords on the top are 14 by 3, and 42, and on the bottom, 14 by 1. So this truss weighs about 30 tons, and it's about 669 pounds per foot. This is the raw weight of the truss. Again, this is just the center line lengths added up, and it, we would need to add additional consideration for the connection material, say 15% or so. So let's take this example and let's add a couple of transfer columns just to see what that does. So everything else is the same, but here we're going to add some columns and we're going to transfer those out on top of these trusses. And the magnitude of those loads are 300 kips dead and 200 kips live. So what, what this shows is our large point load being applied right here for both the dead and the live condition, and all the other loads are the same. Due to that very large point load right, the, right in the, near the center of the truss, we get rather large bending moments in, in that top cord. So 2,200 kip feet is a pretty large bending force. So is there anything we can do to mitigate that? If we make one simple move where we flip that diagonal that was a tension diagonal and make it a compression diagonal, that very subtle move, we've reduced that bending moment down to 1,500 kip feet. So a significant reduction in the bending moment of that cord with a very simple geometric change in the truss layout. And so this is where if you see large moments in 
your cord members, you may want to look at the arrangement of the diagonals relative to the loading and the support conditions and think about making subtle moves like this in order to make the truss more efficient. And so if we compare the design results of the first, the, the truss in, without flipping that diagonal, we get a weight of 58.1 tons, and we get very large cords, a 14 by 730 on the top, and very large diagonals. And we had to move to wide flanges because the diagonal forces were much higher than what could be efficiently resisted by HSS at the end. And then when we flipped that diagonal, we reduced the weight of that truss to 55 tons. So it's a reasonable savings in that truss, as well as I always feel better about having less bending moment in the cord than having more, even if at a modest savings in the uh, truss, uh, truss weight, uh, simply because it's a more efficient truss design. So with that, I thank you very much for listening, and I would turn it back over to Nate. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. We've been fielding questions throughout your presentation, and we'll take a moment to have a Q&A session here. Uh, but first, we'll go ahead and test the audience's knowledge with a couple of interactive polling questions. So the audience, uh, we invite you to, to participate by selecting the correct answers to these, these polling questions on your screen. So the first polling question is this. True or false, a deeper truss always produces a more efficient design than a shallower truss with an otherwise similar configuration. Is that true or false? Again, as people get their answers in, a deeper truss always produces a more efficient design than a shallower truss with an otherwise similar configuration. All right, Tom, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like about 90% of the audience believes that statement is false. Did they get that right? They did. They did. If you remember from the curve, that you reach a point where it effectively bottoms out, and the increase in length of the diagonal members outpaces the, any savings in the cords, and you end up with diminishing returns, and if not, even heavier trusses if you make them significantly deeper. So the answer is false. All right. Good job, everyone. The next polling question is this. Which of the following issues should be considered when designing trusses with bolted connections? A, field fit up. B, tensile rupture of the net section. C, connection length. D, all of the above, or is it E? Answers A and B. All right, again, the question is, which of the following issues should be considered when designing trusses with bolted connections? All right, Tom, it looks like almost everyone thinks the answer is D for this question, all of the above. Well, I would agree with, with them that all of the above should be considered. All right, good job, everyone. So let's go ahead and move into some, some questions that we've fielded from the audience during the course of your presentation, Tom. And the first question is going to send us back to some of these earlier slides, starting on slide 26. The question is, is can you elaborate on pros and cons of selecting Pratt versus Howe versus Warren trusses, and which, which of these do you typically use in your design? Okay, thanks. That's a great question. So 
Again, with the Pratt Trust, the basic premise is that the longest web members are kept in tension. And so that's thought to lead to an efficient design, and it often does. So there really is little downside to this, this method, unless you have variable loading conditions, which might put some of the diagonals that you typically consider in tension into compression, and maybe then the compression ends up governing the size of that diagonal. Um, other than that, it's a very efficient truss, and it's used very, very often in, uh, in building design, building construction. So if we move to the how truss, it, it's an inverse. Um, this is also very efficient. One thing that's done with the how truss when they get relatively deep is a bracing member is often introduced right here. And if the webs are oriented web horizontal, what that does is it cuts the weak axis, bending, uh, weak axis buckling length of the diagonal in half because you get a buckling shape, uh, poorly drawn, but you get a buckling shape that does this. And that can all be a very efficient truss design as well. You'll see these in arena roofs and things like that with very long spans and very deep trusses. Um, the nice thing about this is loads in, in the center are more quickly shed to the support. Um, and that's one of the advantages of this. It's just quicker load path to the support. And then if you put the if the diagonals become long and you put the bracing member in, those can be uh, very efficient trusses. And then finally, the Warren truss, again, all of the load is kept in the diagonals in this case. And you're only using these verticals either to brace this or to collect a beam or two's worth of load and get it down to the panel point. And these are actually very efficient. And we typically are using the Warren truss most often in our truss designs currently. We simply find that they're uh, a little bit more economical in terms of truss weight um, with respect to the other two uh, in our daily practice. All right. Um, we'll just keep it right here. There was a question about uh, deflections um, mm -hmm. and determining deflections properly in your truss design. How do you estimate deflections with panel to cord connections being something between fixed and pinned? Uh, great question. So how do we estimate deflections? So typically we're going to uh, run a model and first consider the, all the web members pinned and we're going to evaluate those deflections. And if we feel that we're working pretty well with that assumption, we'll just keep it there. Um, for vibration analyses, we will typically go ahead and fix those because the input energy is actually quite small. So in the dance floor example, the uniform load on the dance floor is only 12 pounds per square foot. So we would, we would contend that under that relatively small amount of input, there's enough fixity in those connections to try to take advantage of that fixity in the stiffness of the overall system. So when we're getting more and more refined and we want to be more and more refined, we will go ahead and think about some of the fixity with the web members. But more often than not, we're just leaving those as pinned in when we evaluate those deflections. And it's slightly conservative because we do know there is some fixity there. All right. Uh, next question, we'll just go to slide 46 as an example of something to look at while we ask this general question. Do you see weight advantages with using top or bottom co of the cord as the work point as opposed to the center line of the cord? Or do you, see any, mm. do you see any issues with that choice? Um, you know, actually, what you can often improve the geometry of the connection by moving that work point. So the efficiency that you see is in the gusset plate design. You end up spreading things out. You get a little bit more room to work with. Um, and you can bring the diagonal member in 
in certain geometries, you can bring the diagonal member in much closer to the, the truss cord than you can when um, you move that work point toward the center. The downside to that is you do need to consider that eccentricity in the design of the cord. Um, so we are typically not doing that in practice, but it can be done. I've seen it done. Um, and again, it's typically done to facilitate the connection detailing as opposed to um, the efficiency of the members themselves, if that makes sense. All right. So while we're on the topic of gusset plate, design. Let's go to slide 82. There was a, a question on the details and how they're depicted here. Hmm. Um, it seems that it's not necessary on these details to respect the 30 degree Whitmore gusset consideration for the vertical web members. Um, why is that? Typically, it's, uh, we, we typically just consider the effective width for, uh, as being equal. So if we have a small offset on one side, we'll take that uh, same offset on the other and consider that an equal equal. And quite often the uh, force in the vertical member is much smaller than the one that's in the diagonal member simply due to the trigonometry of the situation. And so you get the higher stresses in that diagonal member. And that's what ends up governing and often, too, what ends up governing the gusset itself is the horizontal shear um, and the uh, eccentricity between the shear plane here and the centroid of the connection. And so you, you get a shear and a moment on that, on that, and that ends up being what governs the gusset plate thickness more often than, than anything else. Okay. Uh, let's go to slide 92. Now we got this question a little bit earlier in the presentation before you got it mm. or got to this this topic, but this person was asking as an erector, uh, they typically like horizontal webs for roll up, uh, but the deck d support is more challenging as you say. Have you, mm -hmm. have you heard that from erectors and which direction do you uh, more often go with the, with the web orientation of the cords? For very long span roofs like an arena condition with very deep trusses where the bottom cord is flying through space um, and it's not very frequently braced, we will typically go with the orientation you see in this slide uh, with the web horizontal. The other times that we do this is in complicated geometries on the decking surface because it's, it's a lot easier, like, the, like was suggested in the question, it's a lot easier to make the connections here um, into, that, um, into that web horizontal condition because everything's a flush cut. There's no coping. Um, it's just easy to slide the beams or bring the beams in, swing them in, and bolt them up. Um, and again, you, you, there's a small premium to pay with deck support, um, but in a complex roof geometry, you're doing a lot of deck shimming anyway, and so it's, it's not really much of a premium because you're already doing it. Um, and so those are the situations when we see this most often for most conventional, lightly loaded roofs and lightly ro loaded floors with modest spans. We're typic we are typically going with web vertical. But there's certainly nothing that says you can't do web horizontal in any and all cases. Okay. Next question on slide 106. Uh, the question is this, for the span to depth ratio rules of thumb from earlier in the presentation, were those depths considered center to center or out to out? Out to out, yeah. I, I, I tried to illustrate that. Maybe I didn't make the point as clearly as I had hoped, but um, when we are talking about that, we, unless you have a really, really thick decking system or something, um, we're talking about out to out in that conversation, so total structural depth. Okay. Next question. But that's why it's a very it's a very important conversation. That make sure that if you do, if you are saying ten feet, uh, that and you are meaning center to center, that you're communicating the extra depth to others who might uh, um, be interested in that conversation. 
All right. So in, a question on K values for compression of the web members. Mm -hmm. Do you consider 0 0.9 or 1 or some other value? We typically use K of 1. We took, take the pinned uh, assumption and center line to center line length with a K of 1. That's our practice. All right. Um, here's a question, a general question, sort of came up on slide um, 95. Have you seen any increase of more BIM info earlier in the design process? Um, and how is that going for you on typical projects that you're working on? That's a, that's a great question. Um, we typically are not modeling gusset plates in our practice. Um, and it's important that we communicate that to all the disciplines. Um, sometimes we will modify a region to represent a gusset plate so that um, other disciplines don't think they have free access to the entire space. But it's a great conversation, and it's a conversation of whether or not project benefits from the extra effort associated with modeling all of the connection material and the gusset plates. Um, you know, our, I guess our approach at this point is to not take that on at this, uh, unless it's warranted and, and we have conversations about that. Now there might be a, an occasional gusset or two that we model just to, for uh, a very specific condition, but we're typically not doing that in, um, in our design model or in our BIM model used to produce our design drawings. All right. Thank you, Tom, uh, for answering those questions. That's actually all the time we have for today's question and answer session. A special thanks again to Tom Meyer for presenting to us today. And thank you all for your participation.